Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome. It is 2 p.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Julia Myers, and I will be your host this afternoon. We are coming to you live from the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. We are very excited for this webinar this afternoon on snakes of Florida. Um, if some of you know me, you know snakes are my favorite, so I'm very much looking forward to this. And we've got a wonderful presenter today, Mr. Brian Magnier. He is a wildlife photographer, an environmental educator, an ecologist. Um, so we're looking forward to that. And I want to give a big thank you to our friends group, the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve. They have graciously sponsored our program this afternoon. So if you are interested in learning more about the Friends or becoming a member, you can check them out at the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve.org. And quickly, we are going to do the presentation and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the very end. So if you have any questions throughout the program, you can just put them in that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will answer all of them at the end. And then if you just have a general comment or concern, you can use the chat box for that. And I think that's all. So without further ado, welcome, Brian. Thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, snakes are definitely one of my favorites too. So I love uh, talking about them as much as I can. <laughs> um, so my name is Brian Magnier. Um, I studied ecology and evolutionary bio back in college and um, basically just love all sorts of wildlife from birds to snakes, um, butterflies, flowers. Um, so, and I love taking pictures of all of it. So most of the pictures you'll see and the videos you'll see um, today are ones that I have taken. There's a couple um, that I found online and I credit them where needed um, just to fill in some gaps, uh, places where I ha didn't have uh, really good pictures of specific uh, types of snakes. But with that, we might as well uh, just kind of dive right in and see what we're going to talk about today. So we're uh, first we're going to just kind of define what snakes are. Um, we're going to kind of take a quick little look at uh, snake evolution. Um, and then we're going to look at what species there are in Florida. And that's going to kind of be the bulk of uh, the talk today is just kind of going species by species. Some of the some of the common species, some of the interesting ones, ones that I really like. Um, and then we'll finish up with a few cool snake behaviors. Uh, a lot of people, you know, you think of birds having behaviors, maybe mammals having behaviors, but a lot of people don't give reptiles much credit for having interesting behaviors. So we're going to hopefully change that today. So what are snakes? What makes a snake a snake? Um, I mean, lack of legs, that's, that's kind of the big one. Uh, but there's plenty of critters that don't have legs. You know, what makes a snake different from a worm? Um, you know, are snakes vertebrates or invertebrates? Um, you know, so snakes have bones and teeth, so they are vertebrates. Um, are snakes slimy? No, they've got dry, scaly skin, unlike fish and amphibians. You know, they're reptiles. Okay, so they're, they're vertebrates. Um, they're dry, scaly-skinned critters. And... Snakes are elongated, um, limbless, ectothermic, carnivorous reptiles. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, they always have this relatively long body plan. Um, there's not any you know, short squat snakes. They're generally kind of long, slender critters. Uh, they don't have limbs, but we will take a look at some fossil evidence that uh, shows us kind of how they became limbless. Uh, what's that next word, ectothermic? Well, ecto means outside, outside the body. Thermic, it sounds like thermal, you know, so it has to do with heat. So they get their heat from outside their bodies. Um, you know, sometimes people use the term cold-blooded, um, but it's not entirely accurate. There are some animals that blur the lines between cold and warm-blooded. And so ectothermic and endothermic are kind of the more uh, accurate sort of scientific ways to talk about this. And then the last word, carnivorous, meaning there aren't any vegetarian snakes out there eating plants as their main diet. Um, there are 3,600 species around the globe, um, most, most of them living kind of near the equator, you know, Central and South America, Central Africa, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Australia. So let's take a quick look at some of that diversity of snakes. Some snakes are constrictors, like this tree boa. Uh, they use powerful muscles to squeeze their prey. And while some snakes do live up in trees, there are a few that live down in the ocean. 
Um, this sea crate has evolved this paddle-like tail to help it swim. And it can be seen diving down to hunt on coral reefs a few hundred feet deep. Of course, this is over in the Indo-Pacific near Australia. You're not gonna find any of these sea crates uh, around Florida. Some snakes have intricate patterns and colors that help them to camouflage like this lichen snail eater. And some are venomous, using toxins to catch and subdue prey, and also occasionally for defense. Um, there are mildly venomous snakes that rarely bite people and might only feel like a bee sting, like this uh, blunt-headed tree snake on the left. And then there are the dangerously venomous species, like the vipers. The vipers are a family that includes uh, this brightly colored eyelash pit viper from Costa Rica. Uh, but it also includes those cryptic masters of camouflage, the rattlesnakes. So many snakes, especially the vipers, are famously good ambush hunters, sitting and waiting for prey to get too close, and then they strike. And here, a young rattlesnake has just bitten a lizard with a bright blue uh, belly here, and it's waiting for the lizard to die so that it can eat it in peace without the lizard fighting back. Letting the venom kill their prey means the snakes can target relatively large animals, often seemingly too big to swallow. So here, this little snake just hiding in the corner, here he is with kind of a mouthful, uh, that lizard right there. You can still see its blue belly going down his gullet. So, and this, you know, here's a different rattlesnake trying to swallow a pretty large rat. But how do snakes swallow such large prey items? You know, imagine trying to open your mouth wide enough to swallow a grapefruit whole. You know, you just, you can't, you know, you can't do it. You know, don't go and try, just take my word for it. But human jaws are not arranged in the same way as snake jaws. So not only can snakes open their mouths down more than we can, but their lower jaws are not connected in the front like our chins. So they're kind of spread. Not only are, there, are they opening their mouths wider like this, they can then spread apart so their mouths can be way bigger um, and just fit these enormous prey items in there. And then you can also notice on this right little CT scan of this skull, there's extra rows of teeth up there on the roof of the snake's mouth. And those rows of teeth can actually move back and forth, kind of walking up the prey item. So without any you know, hands, you know, no fork and knife, They've got this giant prey item in their mouth. They basically walk their jaws over the prey item. So now we've got a you know, pretty good idea of what snakes are, what they can look like. Uh, how long have snakes been around? Uh, what did they evolve from? Uh, so the earliest snake fossils come from around 150 million years ago, right in the middle of the reign of the dinosaurs. Um, then near the end of the dinosaurs time, they diversify and spread kind of around 66 million years ago. But if we take a closer look at this fossil here, you know, it looks like a snake, very long, lots of vertebrae, lots of ribs. But if we look close at the back, there's tiny little legs with little feet. Um, and, you know, and using a combination of fossil and DNA evidence, we can say that snakes originally had limbs and then over millions of years of natural selection, these limbs shrank until they disappeared entirely. And in fact, if you take an X-ray of some snakes today, you can actually see little vestigial structures where those limbs used to be many millions of years ago. But what's the advantage of losing your limbs? You know, aren't, aren't hands kind of useful to have? Well, snakes are not the only animals that have reduced or lost limbs. There's multiple lineages of fish, such as eels, that have reduced fins and look like snakes. Um, and then similarly, some large salamanders, such as this siren, have lost their hind limbs and reduced their forelimbs to get better at swimming. Lizards like skinks often have very small limbs, and then some lizards have gone all the way to having no limbs at all, like glass lizards that you can see in Florida. There are dozens of separate instances in evolutionary history of lineages of animals reducing and subsequently losing their limbs. So this is called convergent evolution when unrelated organisms have similar traits due to similar pressures, such as the benefit of slithering or swimming over crawling. And so that's kind of the push 
to have reduced limbs is if you're trying to slither underground or through dense tangled vegetation, those limbs are gonna get in the way. And so it can be better to have this sort of streamlined body plan. Another interesting instance of convergent evolution that we can see in snakes is um, this instance of these pointy noses in these snakes here. So this can be seen in many fossorial species of snakes. So fossorial, kind of sound, sounds kind of like fossil, means they live underground. And the convergence here is these little, these noses, um, they've got like extra little armor kind of on their face and then a pointed face here that helps them dig through loose sand and dirt. So here we've got the leaf-nosed snake, long-nosed snake, shovel-nosed snake, and the scarlet snake. And they've all got these tough, pointy snouts. Um, of the four, the scarlet snake on the bottom left is one that can be found in Florida. The other ones are more desert specialists found in the West, Arizona, California, those sorts of places. So now let's check out some of these snakes that we can see in Florida. And we'll start with some of the most common ones that a lot of you have probably seen. This guy here is the banded water snake. These guys are pretty variable, generally found pretty much anywhere where there is fresh water. Um, I've found this to be one of the most common uh, snakes throughout Florida. They can look a little bit like a cottonmouth, uh, but don't worry, we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. We'll talk about how to tell them apart. But these water snakes are relatively common because Florida is full of fresh water. So another type that you guys may see, the Florida green water snake. I found it to be a bit less common, uh, still associated with water, more of this olive green color throughout. And then the brown water snake um, here with these kind of big blotchy patterns and kind of a weird blocky head. They've got kind of those weird small eyes on the front of their head. Um, none of these water snakes are venomous, um, you know, so you don't have to worry about them. Definitely. You know, don't harm any snakes. Don't try to handle any snakes. Um, you know, just give them their, their space um, and they'll leave you alone too. Uh, we'll take a look at the venomous snakes in a few minutes. Uh, this cool snake here, still closely related to the water snakes, but this one, the mangrove salt marsh snake, can actually be found in and around mangroves near brackish water. Um, this one, this individual, this orange color is kind of a subspecies of the salt marsh snake. Um, it's not entirely clear if it's a population of salt marsh snakes or if it's a hybrid between salt marsh snake and another sister species of water snake. Um, but it is definitely possible to find water snakes like this over in uh, more brackish areas, maybe Whedon Island or Honeymoon Island, uh, places like that. See, like this guy, you know, we found him just right on a beach, basically kind of near a mud flat in a brackish lagoon. Okay, so two of the smallest snakes you can find in Florida. We've got the pine woods litter snake and the ring necked snake. Uh, you generally won't run across these guys unless you flip a lot of logs in the woods. They're very small, pretty secretive, definitely not going to bite you. Even if, you know, you were to pick one up or something like that, they're not going to, they're not going to bite. Um, they're just kind of doing their own thing under logs, generally, under leaf litter. Another small guy, same goes for this Florida brown snake. Small, well camouflaged. Uh, you know, you'll only really find it if you're going to flip a lot of logs looking for it. On the other hand, this species is probably the most commonly seen snake in the daytime, especially away from water. The black racer is very fast. Um, it's diurnal, you know, it's out in the day rather than at night, uh, can get a few feet long, generally hunting uh, fast prey like lizards, large insects, um, you know, things like anoles and frogs. They love, they love hunting those herps. Uh, when cornered or handled, these guys can be a bit more feisty and they will bite if you try to grab them. Um, they're not venomous. Uh, they will almost always slither away very quickly uh, before you've got the chance to pick one up. Usually you only notice them when they're slithering right away really fast and you can hear, you know, they're slithering through the leaf litter. Uh, but this is one that's relatively common. You can find it in suburbs, you know, gardens, backyards, things like that. 
Uh, this individual, you can see the bluish scales and the blue over the eye, this uh, individual is ready to shed his skin. Um, here, we'll take a quick little pause to check out this. Uh, there's a black racer here. This was at Brooker Creek. And this kind of will show you how they feed with that walking of the jaws up the prey item. So here, a uh, black racer has caught a skink. Um, and the skink, you'll notice with that red spot here, the skink tried its defense tactic. The skink dropped its tail and the tail kept on wiggling in the leaf litter. And that is meant to be basically a distraction. The predator will see that tail and go and eat the tail and the skink will live to, you know, keep feeding and keep living and regrow its tail another day. But in this instance, the racer had a good hold of that skink. And so dropping the tail did not help the skink in this situation. But the really cool thing here is just how well this shows you how those jaws can really get that prey item down their throat so quickly without any hands. So this, that was up underneath one of the boardwalks at Brooker Creek. Um, let's get back to this. Perfect. Okay, another fast diurnal snake is the coach whip. Uh, this species is a bit more picky about its habitat than the racer, prefers more pristine kind of sandy scrub, much less commonly seen, um, definitely not as much of a, you know, a yard sort of snake. Um, for this one, you'll have to go kind of to central Florida, kind of along the, um, the, like the kind of sandy ridge that goes down the spine of Florida, uh, where it's a bit drier. Um, you know, you could say high elevation Florida, you know, 20 feet, 30 feet in elevation. Um, it's not very much high elevation, but in terms of habitat um, and how dry the soil is, these guys, they want that little bit of extra elevation, not right on the coast as much. Uh, the garter snake, relatively common species in a variety of habitats, also a good backyard species, pretty commonly seen, and easily confused with the more slender ribbon snake, which generally has more kind of more defined stripes down its side. Um, and the position of the striping differs a little bit from the garter snake. The ribbon snakes kind of have these stripes going right down the very sides, whereas the garter snake, um, it's, it's less defined of a line and the, the stripe can be kind of more up, you know, if snakes had shoulders, kind of where the shoulder line would be. Uh, the corn snake, Here, this one's a decently large species, can get very beautiful. Um, as such, some people like to keep these guys as pets, um, but you know, I've said it once, I'll say it again. Wild animals should definitely be left alone in the wild, you know, not taken, kept as pets. Um, you know, you really don't wanna be handling stuff, especially if you are not an expert and you don't know exactly what species you're handling. Um, as the classic saying goes, you know, take only pictures, leave only footprints. And then here's a young corn snake looking quite different than the adult, you know, much more kind of a pale pinkish lavender almost, um, not nearly as orange. And they can be very variable, but in general, the youngsters look more like this, more patterned, and the adults kind of are more orange and more, um, a little bit more uniform in their color. Rat snakes are also quite variable. Um, up north, you know, maybe from Georgia north through New England, the eastern rat snake, is, rat snake is usually black in color with a white belly or at least a white chin and throat. Um, but in Florida, I've more commonly seen this yellow rat snake, which can range um, kind of in shade from this mustard brown that you see here to kind of a more bright yellow uh, with stripes. And these are one that has, um, is relatively common at Brooker Creek. Uh, if you, you, know, you get there in the morning before it's too hot, and you walk around, this is a, a species that you can actually see and kind of cr can be seen crawling around um, in low trees. Uh, they're often found climbing up in trees. Um, and actually rat snakes are one of the few species in Florida that are often found climbing in trees. So if you see a, a snake kind of up above eye level um, at Brooker Creek, chances are it's gonna be this uh, rat snake. 
Here's that fossorial scarlet snake with its pointy digging nose. Um, and obviously the first thing you're gonna notice about this snake though is that color pattern, which is reminiscent of the venomous coral snake. And that's no accident. You know, the scarlet snake is one of the many species that are non-venomous, but they mimic the coral snake's red, black, and yellow uh, color as protection from predators. And this type of mimicry is called Batesian mimicry. So the, this snake is non-venomous, mimicking something venomous for protection. That's Batesian mimicry. Um, scarlet snakes, they like the sandy scrub habitat, open woodlands, where they're rarely seen above ground during the day. Um, but this one just happened to be uh, kind of up crossing a trail in the early morning. It was still cool out. But usually they're using that pointy nose to be burrowed underground or under leaf litter. Uh, these two snakes, possibly my favorites to find. Uh, the rough green snake, superbly camouflaged in tall grass or up in leafy trees and bushes. Uh, while the scarlet king snake is yet another mimic of that coral snake. Um, and you may have heard the old saying, red against black, venom lack, red against yellow, kill a fellow. While that sometimes, you know, it usually works in the United States, there are exceptions. Um, aberrant color morphs of either the king snake or the actually venomous coral snake can totally render that rhyme useless. Uh, so there can be king snakes that have no black or no yellow. Um, there can be coral snakes where the red is actually touching the black because the bands are, you know, maybe it's like a melanistic sort of individual and it's got more pigment. Um, and so that, that rhyme is really not one that you want to use um, to trust your life on. And then outside the United States, the rule completely falls apart. You know, Central and South America, there are coral snakes and mimics um, that definitely don't obey that rhyming scheme. So it's better to just leave them be, enjoy them from a distance. You know, they're beautiful, beautiful snakes, um, but definitely I would say try not to handle them at all. And so if you look at the Scarlet King snake here, compare that with the coral snake here. This is the real thing. And so even though it is venomous, it's generally shy and hidden underground. So it's very rarely seen, um, definitely not aggressive. If you see one, count yourself very lucky and uh, just let it go about its way. <laughs> A much more commonly seen venomous snake, especially in Florida, is the water moccasin or the Florida cottonmouth. And these are vipers, well camouflaged ambush hunters, um, that they hang out, you know, generally near fresh water. Uh, on the left, we've got a young one, more boldly patterned, uh, almost looking like a copperhead, you know, from farther up north. Um, but as they grow older, they become more uniform, generally darker, like the one on the right here. And so it, let's take a quick comparison here as we're looking at the cottonmouth to think back to the water snake. So we've got the harmless, banded water snake or Florida water snake on the left and the potentially dangerous cottonmouth on the right. Uh, there's a number of ways to tell them apart, uh, but honestly, it is just so much safer to just stand back and enjoy them from a distance again. Um, not all snakes with big triangular heads are venomous. Not all snakes with vertical pupils are venomous. Um, and the converse also holds true. The um, not all snakes with thin heads and round pupils are uh, non-venomous. So, you know, if, if you have to get close enough <laughs> to look at the eyes and see if they're vertical or round um, to identify a snake, then you should not be handling snakes anyway. <laughs> you know, you definitely just want to keep, uh, keep your distance here. Uh, another one of my absolute favorites, the dusky pygmy rattlesnake, the smallest species of rattlesnake. Um, and these guys are actually relatively common at Brooker Creek. This is one thing where Brooker Creek has a, a great population of these guys. And if you're walking along the trails, you know, if you keep your eyes open for something that looks like a pine cone or maybe a little chocolate chip cookie sitting on the side of the trail, um, you may have a good chance of finding the pygmy rattlesnake. They are venomous and they will sometimes rattle, but their rattle is so small that it's barely audible. It just sounds like a little insect buzzing. Um, so don't count on them to warn you of their presence. You know, you don't want to be hiking out on the trails like in flip-flops or barefoot, you know. Uh, so you want to keep your eyes open for them. And then the much larger of the rattlesnakes, 
is the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. This is the last of the four venomous snakes of Central and Southern Florida. Um, well camouflaged, very powerful. This snake can get over five feet long. Here's a young one with just one little rattle, um, but then here's a much, much larger one with that full diamond pattern. Um, they can be found in a variety of habitats. Um, most commonly, I'd say in open palmetto scrub, sort of a dry uh, sort of habitat, but they can be found in wet forests, mangroves, right down in the Everglades. Um, so they can be all over. So you wanna keep your eyes open for them. There are two more species of venomous snakes that get into Florida just barely. Up in the panhandle, you can get copperheads. And over near Tallahassee and just right up kind of against Georgia, you can get uh, the timber rattlesnake. But you have to make an effort to go find them. Down near Brooker Creek and southward, um, these four that I've mentioned are the ones that you have a chance to see. So who's this? This snake doesn't belong in Florida. This is the Burmese python, one of the introduced species that has invaded the ecosystem of Southern Florida. Um, these Burmese pythons can get quite large, over 10 feet in length. Um, and you know they've, they've been in the Everglades now for over a decade at least, possibly like up to like 30 years, but their population has just gone up and up and they have really done a number on a lot of the native mammal and wading bird uh, populations. Um, because they are such large predators with no native uh, um, predators of them. So these large constrictors are originally from Southeast Asia. Um, and this is one species that's really bad for Florida. People are encouraged to actually catch them and then bring them to wildlife officials um, for research and education purposes, you know, to want to get them out of the habitat of the Everglades. But at this point, there are so many thousands of them out there it is going to be tough to try and uh, keep their population under control. On the other end of the size spectrum is another introduced species from Asia. This is the Brahmini blind snake. This tiny little worm-like snake is now wide, the most widespread snake in the world. It has traveled around the globe in soil, often imported uh, with garden plants, um, and it's it earned the nickname the flower pot snake. Uh, they can be locally abundant, especially around suburban areas, generally hiding under logs. Uh, because they live underground in, in the dark, they don't really need to use their eyes. You know, it would kind of, it hurts to get dirt in your eyes. And so it, if you're an underground species, it helps to have reduced eyes or maybe even scales over your eyes. Um, so these guys, they've got some little eye spots there, but they're mostly vestigial. They can detect light and dark, um, but they're not going to be well developed, as well developed as like a viper out on the hunt. Another really cool thing about the blind snake is at the tip of their tail, they have this little spike. And if you pick them up, they will poke you with it. You know, it's not venomous, it's not gonna harm you or anything, um, but it can be really startling if you weren't expecting it. You pick them up and all of a sudden they're kind of like poking you with their little spiky butt. Okay, so that covers most of the species of snakes you'll encounter in Florida. There are definitely a few others uh, that I haven't mentioned, mostly more rare species, things like the pine snake and indigo snake, hognose snakes. Um, those are possible, but they have much lower populations uh, than most of the ones that I've mentioned. Um, but if you have specific questions about them, feel free to ask in the chat or in the Q&A and I will uh, talk about them afterwards. Uh, but this last thing that we're going to talk about is we're gonna spend some time looking at some of the awesome behaviors of uh, Florida's snakes. So the first behavior that's pictured here is well known. It's what gives the cottonmouth its name here. When threatened, the cottonmouth will open up its mouth, revealing this bright white interior. And this is probably meant to be a threat, um, possibly similar to a rattlesnake's rattle, warning potential predators not to mess with it. Um, it could also be, you know, just kind of telling maybe if a deer is walking through the woods and it's going to step on the snake, maybe the snake opens its mouth and wiggles its tail a little bit. And, you know, maybe the deer doesn't want to accidentally step on it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a predator. Um, but this, uh, this cotton mouth will let you know that it's there because it is chemically defended with those venomous fangs. You can actually see one of his little fangs here sticking out right there. Very cool snakes to see. 
Another really interesting behavior is with the ringneck snake. I showed a picture of this guy earlier, but it didn't really look like this. It was mostly gray. That's because the first picture was what you would see slithering by in the grass. You know, it's just kind of the top, the dorsal view. Um, this guy is dark gray on the back for camouflage, but its belly here is fiery orange. And when threatened, it'll often flip over, revealing these bright colors below. And this act is paired with kind of a stinky odor that the snake releases. Um, and just like with the coral snake, bright colors are often a warning of danger. Uh, but the ringneck snake is not venomous, so these colors are probably just a bluff. Once again, it's one of those Batesian mimics of the coral snake's colors. Um, another interpretation of this behavior is that it's playing dead, and the smell and the reddish color is kind of meant to make it look like it's just kind of a rotting snake, and so maybe a predator wouldn't want to eat it if it's already you know, been dead a long time. Another thing that can be kind of cool that the ringneck snake will pair with this belly up is it'll have that tail be really obviously bright red, but it'll kind of subtly hide its head under a curl of its body so that its most important part, its head, is protected in case a predator does start trying to nip at it. And then the last example of really cool snake behavior is the combat dance seen in some species of vipers. So here is a pair of male pygmy rattlesnakes and they're fighting over breeding rights to the females in the area. Uh, basically this combat dance is this mesmerizing full body thumb war with the snakes wrestling each other's heads to the ground um, for kind of to display their dominance. And this can last a really long time. I watched these two battling for over 30 minutes um, I took like 800 pictures in those 30 minutes, uh, which is a lot to go through afterwards, but it was worth it. This is one of the coolest things I've ever, wa uh, I've ever watched. And this was right in central Florida with these uh, two snakes going at it. And it's just, it's just so cool. They're like little dragons kind of fighting for supremacy, but they're such, you know, they're tiny little rattlesnakes. Um, but this behavior, um, you know, here I've got the pygmy rattlesnakes. Uh, doing it, but this behavior is also seen in the cottonmouth and the diamondback rattlesnakes. So it's possible you could, you know, come around the corner of a trail and you'd see, you know, four, five foot long snakes kind of all, you know, kind of tangled up together doing this dance. And here at the end, what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick one more screen share and show this kind of slow motion thumb war that goes on. And so these are the dusky pygmy rattlesnakes uh, doing their combat dance. And it's, it's not a very high energy <laughs> sort of thing, but it gets, you know, over, over time, this looks pretty exhausting. <laughs> so just very cool to witness these guys. And so supposedly, I didn't see a female here, but supposedly there'd be a female or multiple females maybe watching uh, from the sidelines, maybe from kind of a hole in the ground or at, you know the base of one of these logs. And so um, the female would then kind of swoop in when one of them is kind of titled victorious. Um, and then that male would have uh, the breeding rights of the area. Um, so yeah, just one more awesome thing to witness with the snake, uh, the snakes of Florida there. Um, and with that, I went a little bit fast, so I'll be very happy to take any questions people have, or if anybody wants me to go back to any slides in particular, uh, we can look back at any of the pictures, ask questions about specifics there. Uh, but otherwise, that is pretty much it, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. That was wonderful. We do have some questions here. And if anyone else has any questions, now is the time to put them in the Q&A box. Um, we will get started. Our first question. This is a good question, and we get it a lot at Brooker Creek Preserve. Um, can you discuss the aggressiveness of a cottonmouth? Sure. The aggressiveness of all snakes is, I found it pretty much always overstated. <laughs> um, I have very rarely had any encounters with snakes where I've found them to be really aggressive. 99.9% um, .9 of the time, if you just stay more than 10 feet away from a snake, 
it'll just completely do its own thing. Most likely, you know, it'll slither away. Um, the cottonmouth, you know, some of those really camouflaged snakes, it can be tough to spot them until you're really close. And so that's one of the reasons you want to be very aware of your surroundings. You want to wear closed toed shoes. Um, another, it's a good reason why you don't want to have, you know, dogs, you know, you want to really watch where your dogs are sniffing and walking around. Um, you know, and it's a good reason why you don't bring your dogs to Brooker Creek, you know. Um, you know, they're not allowed on the trails and with the population of the pygmy rattlesnakes, you don't want them on the trails anyway. Um, but yeah, with the cottonmouth, they'll, you know, they'll open their mouth, you know, and it looks all scary. And sometimes they'll, you know, do a fake, you know, a little strike at you if you get too close. But I've never had a snake really like chase after me. You know, I've never had a cottonmouth, you know, really come after me, swim across a river to, to attack me. Um, yeah, I pretty much 99.99% of the time, if you leave a, any wildlife on its own, it'll, it'll just kind of do its own thing. They're not to be worried about at all. Wonderful. Thank you. I heard, um, someone who worked with snakes with the FWC give a very similar answer. And he said, if a snake appears to be chasing you, it's most likely looking for an exit route and you are just in the way. Yeah, that actually, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go back to one of these slides, um, go fast for a sec, all the way at the beginning. Um, it reminds me of a little, a funny story from, uh, I was actually leading a snorkeling tour over in Indonesia. And this, the sea crate here, very, very venomous snake. Um, it's got this powerful neurotoxic venom because it hunts underwater, you know, these fast fish, it's trying to catch fish and fish could escape really quickly. You know, it doesn't want its prey to go and hide in the reef and escape it. So it's got this very, you know, fast acting para, like paralytic sort of venom so that it par paralyzes its prey. So it's kind of a scary thing in theory. It's one of these most venomous species of snakes, but they're incredibly reluctant to bite. You know, they really don't bite humans. Um, unless, as long as you don't go and grab one, they're very, very docile. Uh, but I was leading the snorkeling tour and there was this uh, gentleman that was, you know, snorkeling up at the surface and this snake, you know, it, it holds its breath for a long time to go forage on the reef, but eventually it needs to come to the surface to breathe. It doesn't have gills. And so it came up to the surface and this guy just happened to be in the way. The snake didn't seem to care about the guy, but it just wanted to get to the surface to breathe some air. And the snake almost swam right up this guy's shorts. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> Everybody was fine. The snake was fine. The guy was fine, but it was, uh, uh, it gets the heart beating when you see this guy coming right at you. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, our next question. Will you find pygmy rattlesnakes in vegetation near houses? That is, it's possible. Yeah, uh, pygmy rattlesnakes, they often go overlooked because they are so small, but they are relatively common throughout pretty much the whole state. Um, so it is definitely possible to find pygmy rattlesnakes even near houses, especially if your house is near like a little patch of woods or forest or something like that. Um, definitely possible. Um, and again, a good reason to keep an eye on your dog or something like that. If you let your dog out and you have a big yard and it's sniffing around like the back fence near the tree line, that's a, that's a major place where a pygmy rattlesnake could be sitting there and the dog might get bit on the nose or something. Yep, especially um, a lot of houses near the preserve, they've told us they see them pretty yeah. often in their yards. Next question, do you have any idea what the epithet vivitatis means for the Burmese python? Possibly two lives. Oh yeah, um, here, let me see. So the python vivitatis, so bi meaning two. Right. Yeah, the uh, bivitatis, it would sound like it would mean two lines, but without having a, doesn't really have a very line stripey sort of pattern, unless it's talking about the, pad, the stripes on the head is possible there. Um, I don't know offhand. I would have to look that one up and get back to you. A good way to check that out would be if you go on Google and you look up etymology, um, just search etymology of bivitatis or Burmese python. And because the etymology there will tell you kind of the origins, Greek and Latin of these sorts of names. And that's a good place to go. I go, I Google that sort of stuff a lot. Um, and it really helps you learn a lot about some of the critters it helps you remember the scientific names also if you know what they mean. Uh, but yeah, that is a good question. It does sound like it means two striped or something like that. Wonderful, thank you. 
Okay, and the questions are coming in. Um, this person said, no love for the hog nose, but which snakes are critically endangered? I know you couldn't talk about every single snake in Florida. Yeah, yeah, the indigo is kind of the main one. Um, right. That is a major conservation risk, the indigo snake, um, very reduced population throughout its range. 50 years ago, it would have been much more common. Nowadays, I've, I've still never seen one. Um, and then the Florida pine snake, um, I'm not sure, is it, I'm not sure if it's technically endangered, but it's definitely much more vulnerable or threatened than, uh, than most of the other snakes around. Um, yeah, those are the main, those are the main ones, um, the indigo and the pine, I would say. Thank you. And about the pygmy rattlesnakes, are they aggressive um, so far as jumping to attack a person? No, not that I've ever found. I don't, I don't believe I've ever been had one strike, even if I'm trying to move one out of the trail with a stick so that other, you know, people walking the trails don't step on one. I don't think even then I've had them strike at me. Um, it's, it's definitely possible, you know, you don't want to just go and pick one up. Um, definitely not saying to do that, but I, it's one where if it's on the side of the trail, you can pass by easily without, you know, without getting attacked. They're not going to leap out of the bushes. You know, they're only a foot, two feet long at, at most. So as long as you stay more than a foot or two away from them, you know, they're not going to leap out at you. I've had the same experience with them. Um, this person is a science teacher and she was thinking of getting a class pet. Do you think a snake would be a good option? And if so, what species do you recommend? Um, snakes can be good. Um, you know, they're relatively low maintenance, you know. Um, you know, so if if the kids are in charge of feeding the snake and you know they forget to feed it for a week, the snake is still probably going to be fine. Um, unlike with a mammal pet, you know, you need to make sure you're feeding them very, you know, regularly. Um, the main thing is you don't want to take a wild snake. You know, you don't want to, as as tempting as it would be, as fun as it might be in the short term, you don't want to go and find a snake out, you know, on a field trip or something and then take it as a class pet. You know, they belong in the wild. So um, something like a ball python, um, you know, those are kind of common species. Um, you don't want to get a Burmese python. You don't, you know, you want to know what their max length is. You don't want to get a Burmese python when it's this big and then realize, oh, this thing could grow to 15 feet and it could eat, you know, you know, another class pet. It could eat a kid, you know, if it really wanted, you know, but um, so you just want to know what the max length is going to be, what the lifespan is going to be. You know, are you willing to have this snake for 10 or 15 years? Um, because reptiles can be pretty long lived. So those are the main things to consider is the lifespan, the maximum size, and then just what it needs to be fed. Um, you know, are the kids going to like that you're feeding a snake, you know, a dead rat, or are the kids going to be horrified at that? <laughs> yeah. Yes, great response. Um, our teacher here at Brooker Creek Preserve does have a pet corn snake um, that she got from a pet store. And, and it does really well and, and we love it. Um, next question, is the black dot on the head of the Florida scarlet snake just part of its pattern or is that some functional organ thing? I believe that one is just part of the pattern. I don't think they always have that, um, but it's an interesting question because there are reptiles. The main one that I'm thinking of is iguanas. There are reptiles that have a photosensitive scale on the top of their head where it's not, a third eye, but essentially if the iguana or something is sleeping, it can kind of tell if something flies over, if there's shadow above it. Um, as far as I know, they don't, you know, the scarlet snake doesn't have something like that. Um, I'd have to do specific research on that, but it is really cool, you know, definitely, you know, go to Google and check out, you know, lizards with, you know, photosensitive scales on the top of their head. It's a really interesting extra adaptation that some critters do have. But as far as I know, this, this scarlet snake's um, little head scale is, or the, the spot is just pigment. It's not any extra organ. Thank you. And um, the next question is, are there any ways I can encourage rat snakes on my property? Um, if you want to encourage snakes on your property, the main thing is um, you want just decent habitat, just in general. You know, you, don't want to cut your grass really low with a lawnmower. You know, you want to let it get as wild as possible. Um, 
you know, it's, it's kind of a balance because there can be a lot of invasive or introduced plants that grow. Uh, so if you want to learn which plants are invasive or introduced and kind of selectively weed those, but let some of the native plants come back, um, you know, if you have cover uh, like plants, then that'll bring in bugs and mice and then the rat snakes will come to eat them. If you have a big property and uh, maybe it abuts, you know, some forest or something, what you can do also is you can place cover, artificial cover, put logs or plywood out and those like boards and those boards will be something where you can flip them and snakes might hide under them. Snakes could, lift, you know, snakes could live under there. And so um, you can, you know, put cover out and snakes can uh, come to that. Uh, but I'd say that the big one is to make your yard just attractive to wildlife in general uh, with native plants and uh, that'll bring in the snakes. Okay, thank you. I know I could use some rat snakes in my house right now. Um, <laughs> can you recommend any snake ID books for Florida? Um, I, let's see. I'm always, I've been a fan of uh, Peterson field guides. Those are just kind of a general uh, field guide. I think there's one for Eastern North America in general, uh, or the Eastern US. Um, I don't have any specific field guides to Florida, though I think at Brooker Creek, they've got a lot of interesting books. Do you have a specific Snakes of Florida one um, there, Julia? We have the Florida's Fabulous series, and the Reptile yeah. one covers all the main snakes you're likely to see. It's pretty great. So Florida's yeah. Fabulous. That one's good. Yeah. Nice, pretty yeah. pictures in there, too. <laughs> exactly. Um, next question. How and why do indigo snakes share a hole in the ground with gopher tortoises? <laughs> uh, so yeah, so the gopher tortoise connection there, that's an important one. The gopher tortoise is this keystone species um, with their burrows. You know, they've got these deep, extensive tunnels underground, um, which because they go so deep, they can stay at a relatively nice constant temperature and they're nice and shaded, so it gets you know out of the floor, the hot Florida sun. And so there are hundreds of species of animals that uh, utilize these gopher tortoise burrows. Uh, snakes are definitely a major one. Indigo snakes uh, really use them. Uh, diamondback rattlesnakes use them, and I'm sure, and pretty much any snake that happens upon a tortoise burrow would be interested to to go check it out and maybe use it as a little den. Um, so indigo snakes uh, specifically. You know, they're not going to be able to eat a gopher tortoise and a gopher tortoise, which is, you know, an herbivore, a vegetarian, it's not going to hurt the indigo snake. So they can both cohabitate these tunnels. Um, and it's just, it's a good way to stay at a good constant temperature, um, you know, warmer in the winter uh, than, you know, maybe being out in the cold and um, definitely cooler in the summer. Uh, so those gopher tortoise burrows are a great important habitat for a lot of different species. Thank you. And are there any groups that you're aware of that go out searching for snakes to photograph? Um, and if so, how could we be in touch? Um, I sadly, I'm not really aware of any major groups um, that do that specifically. Um, you know, there are tours, you know, international type tours, wildlife tours that are more focused on snakes or birds or things. One thing you can do uh, one is to get more involved at Brooker Creek and try and meet like-minded people there, both the people that work there, volunteers, um, and other guests, you know, people that are hiking there. If you meet other people like that, you know, they might, you know, you can make a friend that way. Um, but there is one group online that's not Florida specific, but on Facebook, I'm a part of this group called North American Field Herping Association. Association. North, so North American Field Herping Association. And that it's just, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of people that you, you know, just on this group in Facebook and, you know, you can post pictures to help with IDs. You can ask for advice for new, you know, for new people going out to herp for herping. But it's also a place where, you know, there's a lot of people that like looking for snakes in Florida um, and you can connect with other people there. So maybe if you see somebody post a picture of a snake from somewhere else in Florida, you know, send them a, a message on Facebook and all of a sudden you've got a new friend to go looking for herps with. Uh, and I did that. That's actually how um, I found um, a new, a, a place that I had never gone herping before. Um, and 
I went with this guy that I met on Facebook with for, through this uh, herping Facebook page. Um, and this, it just kind of introduced me to a whole new place, um, you know, that I hadn't really tried before. And we went and we found a lot of cool stuff, actually, including this, including this rat snake there. Um, and so that's, that's definitely, you know, you want to be wary of meeting random people on the internet, but, you know, in, within a herping Facebook group, you know, I think generally you're going to find some knowledgeable people. Yes, I was going to add, there is a Florida Facebook group called What Kind of Snake Is This Florida? Um, yeah. And that's a great group to, you can kind of find out who's in your county and, and make friends that way. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I don't live in Florida anymore. I actually live out in Oregon now, but if you're ever in my neck of the woods, contact me and I'd be happy to take you out to look for some snakes. <laughs> awesome. And Great follow-up question. What are some great areas to look for snakes in the wild besides Brooker Creek? Uh, yeah, so pretty much anywhere, the, the bigger attractive habitat, the bigger a pristine area of habitat you have, the better, in my opinion. Um, so Brooker Creek is great, really. Uh, walking around those trails, you can see a lot of species of snakes. Um, green Swamp uh, Wildlife Management Area, that's kind of a big, big tract of kind of uh, swampy wilderness. That's a great place to find things like cottonmouth, dusky pygmy rattlesnake, uh, water snakes, um, even just like Lettuce Lake Park. It's just, you know, a little boardwalk in Tampa there. And off of Lettuce Lake, uh, the boardwalks there, I've seen things, you know, wa water snakes, cottonmouths, uh, rat snakes. Um, but pretty much anywhere where you have any sort of decent habitat, snakes are there if you look closely. Um, at my old apartment in, it was in Brandon, Tampa. So just kind of a little suburb where it's mostly surrounded by buildings and roads and malls. And it's, it's not a very wild place, but my apartment complex was just kind of surrounded by a couple little retention ponds and a little bit of woods. And right there, I think I had 10 species of snakes, um, you know, from racers and garter snakes to water snakes um, and ribbon snake, and even those blind snakes that I mentioned. So you know, the closer you look, the more stuff you'll find. Uh, you don't need to travel all the way to the Everglades to find snakes, though you can, and there, it is a great place to find them if you do. Great, thank you. And why do some snakes fight over mating when you were showing that combat dance? Yeah, it's interesting. There's, you know, there's a lot of different systems of mating and reproduction out there. I'm not sure exactly why some snakes would fight um, for an area. There's just different mating systems. Um, one thing that is interesting about the vipers, um, which do this combat dance, is that the vipers actually, and I'm not saying this is necessarily connected, but I'm just kind of thinking of it uh, right now, the vipers give live birth, and they, you know, they don't lay eggs. They don't need to kind of secure a nest or anything. Um, they don't need to, you know, I don't know. I feel like maybe having live birth is connected in some way um, to, uh, let's see. So if you have live birth, then you're probably, you're holding on to the snake embryos longer. You're not going to just get rid of these eggs. So it might be a more, co uh, more cost to a female to have live birth because maybe she wants to hold on to these babies for longer. And if there's a bigger cost to the female, then maybe she wants to be more choosy about which male she mates with. So maybe that would be why the, she wants to pick only the strongest male. And to prove that they're the strongest, maybe they do these battles. Uh, but that is not at all, you know, you'd have to do some research on that. That is just kind of a random thought there. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure uh, why certain snakes fight for rights, you know, to females and others do not. Um, that would take a lot of research into kind of the ecology and whether they're actually fighting for specific females or whether they're fighting for an area, a territory, you know, maybe with access to food. Uh, those are all different little complex sort of um, different um, kind of factors to think about. Interesting. And this is a great follow-up question. Someone said, can you talk about breeding? Some lay eggs and some have live birth, which are which? Yeah, so um, the, the vipers, uh, so the cottonmouth rattlesnakes, those guys would lay, have live birth. Um, and, you know, so they, they don't lay eggs at all. Um, and so they probably will have fewer 
babies, but they'll be bigger, you know, more well-formed. Uh, whereas most of the other snakes, I think, unless you can think of any off the top of your head. Oh, the much water snakes have live birth too. Okay, the water snakes too. So I know the racers lay eggs because we've actually found racer eggs at Brooker Creek. Um, uh, but yeah, so the water snakes will be live birth. A lot of these smaller guys have eggs. Oh, and one thing that's actually really cool about reproduction is the blind snake is um, one of the ways that it has spread so successfully around the globe. I'm pretty sure it is parthenogenetic. So it's all, they're all females and they're basically clonal. So they don't need a male at all. You can just have one blind snake and then all of a sudden you got a lot of blind snakes. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Next question. Um, this person said, I'm terrified of snakes, but I love to walk in preserves. How do I avoid them? Is there a better time of day to walk? Um, and what do I do if bitten? Um, so the first thing, I, the first two things that go kind of hand to hand is being aware of your surroundings, just watching where you're walking and then, you know, wearing decent, foot, you know, something hiking boots or shoes or something like that. Um, just, just so that your toes aren't exposed. And that'll be, honestly, it'll be more helpful for things like thorns and poison ivy than it will be for snakes. Um, but it's just a good idea to have that, you know, to, to wear closed toed shoes. Uh, but really being just kind of aware of your surroundings, looking where you're going um, and not just kind of running through the bushes and high grass and things like that. Um, snakes, they like warmth, you know, so if you're out in, you know, early in the morning, um, snakes are probably going to be less active. They might still be out, but as, if they're still warming up, um, they're probably not going to be very fast. They might just kind of be kind of hanging out on the side of a trail, sunning themselves. Um, in the winter time, I know Florida is not super cold in the winter, uh, but in the winter, uh, if you're out in the early morning or late evening, you probably won't see any snakes uh, unless it's a really warm, sunny day. Um, but yeah, and if if you are bitten, which I will say is incredibly rare. I will say it is incredibly unlikely that if you're not actively trying to pick up and handle a snake, um, you probably will not be bitten. But if you are bitten, um, the first thing is to see what type of snake bit you. You know, just, you know, take a picture of it with your cell phone if you can. Um, just kind of see what, what it was. And then, you know, go to um, the hospital in case you have some sort of adverse reaction. Um, in general, I mean, the, a coral snake is, it's going to be so kind of hidden and small and secretive and shy. They're not going to be the ones that just randomly bite you. So if you do happen to be bitten by a venomous snake in Florida, it's going to be most likely cottonmouth, possibly, you know, the other, the two rattlesnakes, but all three are vipers. All three have hemotoxic and cytotoxic venom. So they are going to be, it's more, you know, kind of a you know, a tissue damage thing where the bite was, but you could be allergic to the venom. And so you could have an anaphylactic sort of reaction, even with hemotoxic venom. So if you are bitten by a snake, then definitely, even if you're not feeling bad initially, you know, you can get to a hospital or something like that, just to make sure um, that everything is cool. But again, incredibly rare. I have wandered around all sorts of crazy habitats middle of nowhere, flipping logs and looking for snakes. And the only time I'm ever bitten by snakes is when I pick one up and it bites me on the hand to let me know to put it back down. And I generally do put them back down when they do that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I've heard from many herpetologists that most bites happen while trying to catch or kill a snake. So if you're not trying to do either of those things, your chances are pretty good. Yeah. Um, and that kind of goes along with another question we had of what to do if you are bit by a venomous snake. And you kind of covered that. Um, we also recommend removing any jewelry just in case you swell up. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the, the basic first aid, if you are bitten by a snake and it is venomous, you know, um, you don't suck out the venom. You don't cut on the venom. You know, you don't cut like an X where the snake bite was. Um, it, the, the advice actually goes a little back and forth on tourniquets. Nowadays, I think it's more about, um, uh, you can do a compression bandage, but not like a straight tourniquet. So if you're bitten on the wrist, say you don't want to tourniquet the arm really tight. Um, you want to more maybe wrap, you know, something 
a bandage or a shirt or something around um, like the whole arm just to kind of compress it, keep it immobile, you know, keep trying to keep the person calm, give them water, get, you know, just kind of get them calmly but quickly to a medical professional type person. Exactly. Okay. And what is your favorite snake? Oh, that probably changes day to day. There's a lot <laughs> of cool snakes out there. Um, uh, let's see. In Florida, I really liked um, all of those, uh, the coral snake mimics, so the scarlet snake, the scarlet king snake, and the cor coral snake themselves. The dusky pygmy rattlesnakes always have a special place in my heart. They're just so adorable, and they're, they can be really pretty. Some of them are almost kind of brown and camouflaged, but some of them are just like these nice slate gray with that kind of orangey, yeah, that orangey cream sort of stripe down the back. Um, outside of the U.S., you know, some of these these first guys that I showed from Costa Rica are pretty sweet. The little eyelash pit viper, bright yellow, uh, definitely up there on my list. And then around here in Oregon, probably my favorite is the rubber boa. There's a species of boa that gets all the way up here into Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. And they just feel like this rubber fishing lure type thing. They just feel so weird, um, but they're really cool, really fun to find. Uh, and I found a few of them in the last year. So those are, those are very cool. I love those. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And someone asked, is the coach with snake endangered? They've only seen one a handful of times in the wild. I don't believe it's endangered. I'd have to, don't quote me on that one. I don't believe no, I it's agree. endangered. I don't think so. Yeah, they are rel I think one of the reasons they're not endangered is they are relatively widespread. Even if they're kind of picky sometimes about their habitat, um, and it's rare to see them. I've, I've also only seen a couple, um, but you, there's coach whips all the way over to Arizona and they get pretty far north as well. So they've got a decently wide range. Um, so they're not at risk of extinction. Um, but if there's like a Florida subspecies or something, it's possible that that population might be a bit smaller. Um, but I, yeah, I do not believe they're endangered, possibly not even threatened as far as I know. Okay, next question. Are the indigo snakes aggressive? Um, not that I am aware of, whoops, that was weird. Um, not that I am aware of, I've never tried to handle them. They, I've heard that they can be a bit more bold and actually come towards you instead of running away from you, but I've never heard about anybody being actually bitten or even struck at by them, no. You'd just be lucky to see one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd be very lucky to see one. Okay, um, what is the best way to get a black racer out of the garage? <laughs> um, Generally, they just try to avoid, avoid me, you know, like if you, so if you, if it's cornered, you know, kind of walk to one side and it'll probably slither just away from you. Um, if you really wanted to, you know, you could get, you know, some sort of a long pole and just kind of, you know, poke near its tail and prod it and kind of push it out. Um, and like I said, they're not venomous. So you could try to, you know, pick it up to get it out of the garage. And most likely when you go to actually try and pick it up, it'll, it'll just skedaddle before you even get a hand on it. Um, yeah, just make, you know, if there's a clear path for it from where it is to the outdoors, um, you know, just kind of, yeah. you know, kind of stare it in that direction. It'll probably leave. Maybe try a broom. Like that. Yeah, a broom would be good. Something nice and soft. Something, yeah, you can sweep it right out the door gently and carefully. Um, and like, a, you know, they're, they can be a little feisty, but even if they do bite you, it's really not painful at all it's um it's not bad so worst case scenario if it really is looking feisty it's still not going to be a big problem okay we've got a couple more here do any snakes here eat the cuban tree frogs or the cane toads which are our two um invasive frogs that are an issue here right now yeah that's that's one of the big problems is both of those are pretty well guarded with little poisons um i I mean, that's one of the reasons why they're so explosive in their populations in the first place is that they really don't have any predators. Um, the Cuban tree frogs, especially, man, after a spring rain, you know, there have been times where I've seen hundreds of them out, you know, uh, all at once. It's, I won't say that they never eat any of them. I feel like I may have seen pictures of snakes eating Cuban tree frogs, but I don't think it's pretty normal. I think they're pretty well guarded with toxins, the frogs. And so I think, unfortunately, they pretty much 
can do whatever they want as far as uh, snakes and birds, you know, predation goes. Um, but that's something that eventually might change. You know, it's, it's possible that on, you know, a multi-generational sort of time scale, some snakes might be better at eating them and dealing with the toxins than others. You know, and maybe if the, you know, the Cuban tree frogs, I'm sure they're, they're pretty much here to stay at this point. So hopefully eventually something will learn how to eat them or evolve some way to eat them if we're lucky. <laughs> and whichever creature does happen to randomly evolve to be able to eat Cuban tree frogs first, they're going to have a major advantage because they're going to be able to eat a ton of Cuban tree frogs. And so that gene will spread very quickly in the population. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. And the last question is asking, I can answer it, if uh, we need any more people at Brooker Creek and we are always open to new volunteers, you can email us at brookercreek at pinellascounty.org or come in during our opening hours and fill out a volunteer application um, and we'd be happy to have you. <laughs> and let me just double check, I think we have got all of the questions answered. Okay. I wanna thank everyone for, oh, sorry, what? No, I'll just say a quick Google search shows that um, there are a few species that do are starting to eat the Cuban tree frogs. Rat snakes and ribbon snakes will actually eat them. But even so, I think, even so, I don't think it's super common just based on the numbers of Cuban tree frogs I've seen. Right, right. That's good to know. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We're really glad you wanted to learn about snakes with us. They're our pretty underappreciated species and just as important as all of our other wonderful animals here in Florida. So thank you for taking the time to learn more about them with us today. Thank you so much, Brian, for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you. And I think that is all for today. So everyone have a great rest of your week and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. <laughs> All right.